Hi, I'm Jennifer from Shabby Fabrics. Welcome to our four part Christmas series. Each week we'll be showing you a fun new project that is so achievable, so fun, and so fast. We'll be going over the Dresden wreath Christmas wall hanging that's behind me. So fun and embellished with buttons and bows. We have the beautiful poinsettia um, pillow. We've made that with wool felt and have just a lot of fun with that. We have a vintage sewing machine ornament, and look how cute that is with a decorative sulky thread. You can add that or not, that's your choice. And then we've used English paper piecing, papers and templates to create the cutest ornaments. So if you're having an ornament exchange at work, this is a perfect idea for that. So for today, we're gonna to be focusing on the Dresden wreath project that's behind me, and I'm gonna show you how fun, how quick, how easy, and in just a few hours, you'll have this project together. So let's just look at the project behind me. Uh, I've used the 18 degree creative grid Dresden ruler for that, and also the prairie pointer. And I'm using the spinning mat and all kinds of supplies. We'll be going over those as we progress in the video. So let's think, let's first start off with, uh, you need of course a variety of green strips for your Dresden fans. And I found a beautiful set from Wilmington Prints called Essential Gems, and this is the Emerald Forest set. Now I believe there's 20 strips in here, 24 strips in here. We were able to make not only the Dresden wreath while hanging, but also the English paper piecing ornaments. The um, No So Quilted Christmas Tree was from a previous video. Be sure to subscribe to, to our YouTube channel so that way you never miss a project. But that was on a previous video and that took an entire Essential Gems packet. So if you want to make that as well, just be sure to pick up a couple of these and that way you'll be able to achieve all of the projects behind me. But we just picked this up because it's convenient and everything's already cut to two and a half inches. So the next thing that we chose was that Creative Grids 18 degree ruler. It comes with the actual wedge and then the center. We'll be going over the center a little bit later on. Um, we grabbed out our strips. These are just some of the strips that are left over. And the first thing that we did is we cut them into five inch sections. Now you can make your wedges longer if, you're, if you are, you know, we have this available as a kit. So everything I'll be showing you will be how to achieve the exact project behind me. But let's say that you want to make that out of your stash at home. You can make up to a nine inch long wedge. You can make this huge if you want to. If you're going to be using two and a half inch pre-cut strips, the, the maximum length of each fan will be five inches because that's what's spanning that two and a half inch width. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm just gonna take this to my spinning mat. Super convenient. You'll see why I love that spinning mat. Um, the first thing that I'm gonna do, looks like I'm just gonna use the edge of this, right? I just need a straight edge. Not typically what you use a dress and ruler for, but you know what? That's life. You kind of make it work, right? Just cut that off. And then I'm gonna cut five inch sections. Let me make sure I have this lined up just right. One, two, three, four, five. And you notice how I have a stack of these. There's no reason to cut them one by one. You can cut four, five, six um, stacks of fabric. Um, I don't know if I'd go a whole lot more than that um, because it can tend to uh, really dull that blade but I consistently cut four to six inches at one time just to expedite the process of getting the fabrics ready to go. Once that's cut out, I'm gonna turn this and I got my edge here and there's my five, okay? So I'm going to lay this on here like that. And you can see now what I meant where five is your limit if you're using two and a half inch strips. I can't go with a six inch long fan because it's wider than my strip. Of course, if you're cutting your own strips, you can do whatever whatever length you'd like. Now, this is why I love the spinning mat. I'm holding steady. I trim and rotate. This is not just more accurate, but more safe. Move my fingers a little bit further away from that. Okay. Because if I had not done that, let me bring out another strip I had. Let me show you what the temptation is, and believe me, I've been tempted by this as well. Let's say that I have my strip out and I have my fan like this. This is why if you don't have a spinning mat, get one. 
I've made this cut. And now how do I go do this? This is neither natural or safe. Don't even go there. So a lot of times what I would do is actually move my fabric and all of a sudden I've lost my accuracy. You get the idea. Just get a mat if you don't have one. You'll be so happy that you did. And as I mentioned before, your cuts will be a lot more accurate because you're not moving the fabric. Now that I've got my wedges cut out, and of course you would just keep doing that for all of your wedges all at the same time, the next thing that you'll do is you're just going to bring those two points. So here's your wedge. Bring those of the wider side together. And there's no reason to really even put a, pr a press in there. You're just going to take this to the sewing machine and sew a quarter of an inch. Now I've done that ahead of time. Let me show you what that looks like, okay? I simply just sewed a quarter of an inch. So that's what that looks like. Now with your rotary cutter, you have the folded edge and then you have the two raw edges. I'm just going to come in and make a slight cut right there, keeping well away from my thread. What that does, we'll put that aside for now and we'll bring out our pressing mat. What that does is makes it possible now for that seam to lay open. This is a tool I found, Prairie Pointer. I love this thing and I use it for certainly making prairie points, but also for something like this is equally handy. So there's a center line right there. I'm just going to bring that in, give a nice push, and I'm going to lay that seam open. And that seam is running straight down that line right there. And I will go ahead and press that seam open. I'm using a um, a special type of iron today. This is a sealing iron. I use this for applique. I will be appliquing the centers of the Dresden fans a little bit later. It was a little more convenient for me to just to have one iron out today. Um, so if you don't have a sealing, a sealing iron, gosh, another thing, just get one. They're very affordable. They have a rheostat. So if you're working with fine fabrics on a lower temperature, you can just turn the temperature down. If you've done any kind of applique where you turn the edges under, a great tool to have. So I pressed that seam open. Now I'm going to flip that exactly. And I'm going to come back with that prairie pointer again. Get right into that point, push, because I like a nice pointed fan. And my seam is running right down the center. I want you to see that. There's that center line and my seam is just an extension of that center line. And I'll press again with my sealing iron or a regular iron. You don't need the sealing iron to do this project. I just chose it because it was convenient and small. So don't think you can't use a regular iron. Of course you can. And I'll press that. Now you'll just keep doing that for all of your fans. There's 20 fans per um, Dresden wreath. And we chose, I think we chose like 10 different fabrics and used each one four times um, for a total of 40 sections. Um, I think that's how we did that. So you can mix it up. You know, there's a beautiful variety here. You can make each dress and fan completely different if you want to. That's completely up to you. Okay, so you get the idea of how to prepare your Dresden fan. Now this is an important thing. You're used to, when you sew sections together, you're used to placing things right sides together. We do that all the time in quilting. But remember that this edge here, once we have this open, in fact, let me show you a quadrant that we've already sewn together. That, you don't want any threads poking out there. For that reason, what I would like you to do and what I found to be a great tip is, rather than starting to sew at that edge, start about in this position, maybe down three quarters of an inch, go back and then come back down. We've done that ahead of time. I wanted you to show, see that. Looks so like we started right there, backed up and came back down. The reason we do that is when we clip our threads, because I don't clip right to that thread. I leave like, I don't know, like an eighth of an inch. You don't want that poking up here. Once you've done that and sewn those together, simply press those seams open. Okay, and you will go ahead and make a section of five. Very important. Don't just keep adding on to that section. 
make a quadrant of five, put it aside. Get five more fans, put those together, put that aside and keep doing that. Then you have two sections of five to sew together to make that half. Repeat that for the other half and sew together. And that's really true of when you sew rows of a quilt together. Don't just start with row one and add two, three, four. You do it in sections and that helps alleviate distortion um, overall in the quilt. Now, once you have all of your Dresden fans sewn together, this is what it'll look like. Isn't it pretty? I just think it's so gorgeous. Now we have a beautiful um, fan here. You can by all means find your center by you know, folding and folding. Always the easy technique to find the center. And then you could quickly mark that if you wanted to with something or you know what, you're moving so quickly, you would be able to just position that. Now decide if you want a point up or you want the V up and be consistent. We have a point up on each one of these we could have turned it so that there's a V up like this. Just whatever you do, be consistent and the quilt will look better if there's a uniformity versus they're kind of all a little bit different. Once you figure out where your center is, this is where I love the Roxanne's glue based it. Again, if you don't have it, just get it. You're gonna use it more than you believe you will. I use it for almost any time I'm adhering something to a background and I don't want it to shift, even buttons. And I'll go to that a little bit later on. Simply just take off the cap and I just put little dots of glue just all around. I'm just going to dot this. You don't need a lot, right? You're just, you're going to secure this by machine, but I don't want to pin this to the background. I want this to be good and flat and you're just going to continue as, you know, all the way around. You can put little dots here. There's no rhyme, no reason. You don't need gobs of glue. You don't want gobs of glue. Um, as I said, you're going to position that over your center. Let's just say that's where I believe my center is. I'm just visually kind of believing that's my center right now. Okay, and you would secure that. Of course, I would have put on much more glue because I do not want that thing moving when I stitch that to the background. You can choose to sew that down by hand. You could sew that down with green thread, or you could use the monopoly in the upper part of your machine and the bottom line in the bottom, and that's a clear. That's completely up to you. The center of the quilt is again, you have an option here of either just doing fusible applique for the center, where you would simply trace this out onto some fusible webbing, Put this on the back of this fabric, cut it out, and just iron that to the middle and stitch around the edge. Or, since everything else is turned under nicely, I like to turn the center under nicely. And I'm gonna show you quickly how you can do that. I like turning the edges under just because there's something about that three-dimensional look that is just beautiful. And that's how we did do the quilt back here, is that center is done that way now. Same thing you're going to do, you'll get some freezer paper. And I simply trace this out, you know, with my friction pen, um, or actually probably not a friction pen because as soon as I put heat on it, it's gonna be gone. So I will go ahead and show you how I would actually do this. Now this is a friction pen. I don't think I have a regular pen with me at the moment, but I think we might be able to get away with this because I'm gonna put another layer on top of this. Let's see if this will work. This is gonna be a test. We'll see if this is gonna work. Nope, it disappeared. That's okay. <laughs> hey, I've told you before that friction pen disappears with heat. Even through freezer paper, that thing disappears with heat. That's fine. I'll show you another option we've got. Here's a pen. We'll go ahead. Now, normally I would have obviously traced with something that won't be disappearing with heat and putting that layer on over top so the drawing is encased in there. Um, now I would simply just cut out on the line. I've done that ahead of time. Let me see if we used a real pen on that one. Okay, so iron this to the center fabric, which is the same as the background, and cut a nice healthy quarter inch, and then we even went a little bit beyond the quarter inch. That's fine. Let me show you how to Turn that under using spray starch, a stiletto, and a brush. So with my 
um, they call this a fabric dye brush. If you're right-handed, put the stiletto in your left hand. This is just liquid spray starch. I just used Niagara, that foaming spray starch, and sprayed it in a cup. And I do that ahead of time just so that the foam goes down and it liquefies. I just brush on some of that and I'm avoiding the paper. I'm just brushing this right now onto the fabric and I'm gonna scoop up underneath here with my sealing iron. It's on the hottest setting and I'm just drawing the fabric very snugly over top of the template. I don't know if you can hear that. It's a sizzle. That's how hot the sealing iron is. By the way, if you buy one of these, I have made it a habit because I've been quilting since my kids were little, little. Rather than just turning the dial down, I unplug it. I just made it a habit since my kids were little. They're not little anymore, but I just, just do it. That way, because kids like to turn knobs and they like to turn dials but they're probably not gonna plug something in. So if you do have little ones around, rather than just turning the dial off, I leave it all the way turned up and I just unplug it. It's just safer that way. So just something I've learned along the way. It's so hot that it, the, it would sure burn someone pretty badly. Um, okay, notice how I work in small sections. That's because I don't want that template getting wet. So of course, water will migrate toward the template. So I just work in small sections and you can see how quickly this actually um, goes. Once you've had a chance to just do practice a little bit, you're going to be able to turn the edge under on any applique shape. Now we have an applique kit available. So if you've never tried this before, we have a whole applique series, that's the eight part series. It's available on YouTube. Again, subscribe to that channel so you're never missing out. Um, and I'll show you every step there is to the applique process. I mean, from beginning to end and show you how to use each one of the tools in greater detail. So that's a great series and it's a great kit to purchase because you know most of that is something you'll never purchase again. Um, done. Now the cool thing is I would only have to do that, make that template one time. Like, how can that be? There's four centers. True, but watch, because I doubled up my paper, it's so strong, the template is so strong, I will use it again. For the quilt behind me, I only made one of those and I made each center out of that same exact template. So it does, um, you know, if you're only gonna make the template once and you can reuse it four, five, six, seven, eight times, it's wonderful. My center's ready to go, just like before. You're just putting dots of glue, right? Just like before. Positioning that over your opening. And get that thread out of the way. And there. Now, of course, you would, like I said, you've already stitched this down, you'd stitch this down as well. The buttons, um, I've learned something along the way. I would struggle at times when I would be putting buttons down you know, I'm trying to hold that button in that exact position. I've got needle and thread. I've learned something along the way. I put little dabs of glue and I just place things where I want them. And I kind of go around my project, putting those buttons down. I go away for like 15 minutes, do something else, 20 minutes. When I come back, it's wonderful. I don't have to worry about that button shifting while I'm sewing it down. So that's something else I've learned that's wonderful about the glue. The bow on our Dresden wreath is a option. You could use regular satin ribbon. That is a blog tutorial on the Shabby Fabrics blog. It's called The Shabby. You can certainly get to the blog from our homepage. And consequently, for the rest of the Dresden wreath, at the very bottom of the homepage, there's a link for free downloads. Click that. You'll be looking for the Dresden wreath um, the dress and wreath wall hanging download. And that's going to be giving you the inner uh, sashing strips, outer borders, and binding measurements to complete the project. So I hope you enjoyed making the dress and wreath wall hanging with me today and stay tuned for the rest of the projects in the series.